Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, this panel is composed of military and civilian faculty from the United States Coast Guard Academy, Norwich University, and Ferrum College. We're here today to present Adopting U.S. Coast Guard Academy Methods for Teaching Leadership and sharing our collaborative methods towards developing our respective leadership programs. So we're going to get into our uh, presentation. I hope you all enjoy it. Um, so next slide, please. I am Dr. Sharice McBride, um, and I'm going to be presenting today. I'm going to follow the format that you see here in, in today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna begin with project overview. I'm going to introduce the panelists. The panelists will present their sections and we'll open the presentation. Well, we would have opened the presentation up for discussion, but you'll just see my email at the end and you can contact me. Okay, so next slide, please. All righty. So uh, this project began in the fall of 2022 at the Coast Guard Academy, where military and civilian faculty, some newly hired, had to quickly develop a consistent learning experience for cadets across six different sections of OBNL. So we came together and started sharing materials such as a common syllabus, and it worked out for us. We uh, presented at conferences representing the USCGA and have a publication with Norwich University's inaugural leadership journal in progress. A few months after our presentations at Norwich University in April of 2022, the project expanded. I moved from the CGA to Ferrum College and saw an opportunity to use CGA methods in OBNL. And not long after, Dr. Morris here from Norwich University reached out to the CGA, unbeknownst to me, to ask for more information about our project. So here we are, uh, Director of Cadet Leadership Development, uh, Lieutenant Commander from the Academy um, that prepares officers for the US Coast Guard, I should add, an Associate Professor at a small Appalachian Methodist College and a Doctor of Philosophy from the oldest private military academy in the United States. It already sounds like an interesting collaboration. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay. So Mr. Jonathan Heller, I'm gonna introduce him first. He's retired from the US Coast Guard. He served in federal service for over 20 years. He's currently the director of cadet leadership development at the CGA. Previously, however, he was the director of the Loy Institute for Leadership. He is an alumni of CGA with an MBA uh, and he's close to finishing up his PhD. Okay, so next. And next up we have uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Edward Gaylor, and he's a CGA alumnus as well, uh, class of 2013. His experience includes many roles and assignments, too many to name here, for the Coast Guard. He has an MBA and a background in HRM, and he's now what we call a military rotating instructor at the Coast Guard Academy. He teaches different courses in the area of leadership and OBNL, as well as other classes, including negotiations. Um, so next. Okay, so I'm Dr. Teresa McBride. Uh, currently an associate professor of business and program coordinator at uh, Ferrum College in Virginia. I taught OBNL at the CGA from 2022 to 2023, um, including a summer course. I have academic and non-academic professional experience, got a PhD in Scotland focused on management, and I hold an MBA. And next up, Dr. Daniel Morris, he is an assistant professor of philosophy at Norwich University in Vermont, which is the oldest private military school in the United States, I should mention again. Norwich offers undergrad and graduate level leadership programming. Dr. Morris has a PhD in ethics and religious thought, as well as an MA from Yale's uh, Divinity School. He's interested in using questions of vocation to better our understanding of leadership. So now we're gonna get started with the different sections. Um, and we'll begin first with Mr. Heller and Lieutenant Commander Gaylor. Sure. Thank, thanks so much, uh, Teresa. We're, we're going to, Ed and I are going to talk about, um, uh, as, it's, as it shows here, our framework for how we develop leaders of character and, and the methods we used in that organizational behavior and leadership course that, that we referenced. And then we'll talk a little bit about the collaboration that we've done across our three institutions. So, um, so next slide, Dan. So the Academy uses uh, our, our lead strategy uh, for how we do this. And um, it's based on Kolb's experiential uh, learning model, but, um, but, but basically we learn from theory, we experience through practice. So we know that we learn by doing, but then there's that uh, really, really important sense-making process of uh, stepping back and analyzing using reflection and deep understanding from mentoring. And you can imagine that at a service academy, which is going to be very experientially based, 
we do a lot of things, a lot of activities, a lot of team building, a lot of um, um, a, a lot of places where the leader, designated leader, follower. Um, they're in a military barracks, as you might imagine it. But linking that into theories and models uh, is critical to being uh, to being a professional in this space. And then um, stepping back and saying, as the slide says here, you know, hey, what went well? What were you trying to achieve? What could you have done better? Um, and then deepen understanding from mentoring. So it's not just mentoring of uh, of helping people find their path, um, but but real, it's really a coach approach to, to mentoring to help them deepen their understanding of the process they just went through. So again, heavily on the experience, but we link it in with theory and uh, reflection and and, um, and mentoring. So next slide, Dan. And then we do this through um, the Coast Guard uh, has has leadership competencies they want us to develop in our cadets. And uh, and they, they break them into two big broad categories, leading self on the left and leading others on the right. So these are the 13 leading self and others competencies that we very deliberately link our, our experiential programs into with only like two or three at a time. So they know when they're in this particular um, project, I'll just use, for example, when in the summer of their rising junior year, They'll all go on sailboats for uh, with a crew of eight and a, a, a faculty member, and uh, they'll go around for ten days, rotating through the jobs of helmsman, cook, deckhand, um, watch captain, navigator, uh, et cetera, in that designated leader role of, of being responsible for the safe navigation of that vessel for the day. And in that particular program, we're practicing um, team building, one of the leading others competencies over there on the right as well as technical proficiency, one of the leading self ones on the left. Um, and tech proficiency is obviously sailing. Uh, and then the team building is they're, they're in that compressed environment where they're going through um, they're going through the uh, the form, storm, norm, perform uh, stages of group development uh, while they're living within 44 feet, toes to nose for 10 days um, in their bunks. So um, so it, it, it's a compressed uh, in, environment. So that that's just an example of how we do it in that one particular experiential program. Every day they uh, they, they get exposed. Well, they get exposed to the theories of um, we use the DISC model to understand communication styles, um, and uh, and then uh, Tuckman Bruce Tuckman's um, group dynamics model of form, storm, norm, perform, and then they go through the experience. Then each day they take a timeout afterwards and say, Hey, how did how did we do today? What could we have done better? How are we growing as a team? They have an individual debrief with that um, with that uh, faculty member. At the end of the day, they were the designated leader. And then they have an individual debrief at the end of the 10 days about what they got out of the entire experience. So that is the D, deep in understanding through mentoring. And they all write a reflection essay, uh, which is their analyzed using reflection of what they got out of the, uh, the experience. So just one little example, we have nine of those experiential programs, including the four years they spend in the military barracks. Um, uh, but, um, but that's a little example about how we use our lead strategy in the leadership competencies. Um, uh, and we'll turn it over to Ed to talk about the collaboration we did with the two universities. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Heller. Um, so I think um, bringing it back to, to our second point as well, just kind of bringing it back to the org behavior and leadership course. So uh, Mr. Heller kind of ta ta talked about um, the lead strategy, um, broadly speaking from CGA, but um, we're guided by that lead strategy um, internally within OBNL, which is which is a great thing about the lead strategy. So um, applying it to our classroom, a, a, as John highlighted, we're um, try we're very we're largely experiential. Um, you know, it is a uh, course or behavior course and leadership, um, but we look for a lot of ways to be experiential and then again be guided by that lead strategy. So um, I think Mr. Heller highlighted a few of them, but we think about learning from theory. Um, we have Kelly's followership model, as he said, we do a Healy case study, um, uh, which is a tragic case of some divers um, that were lost, uh, Coast Guard divers that were lost, and we apply it to the followership model. Um, we do Tuck Tuckman's model, group, group dynamics, a host of other leadership theories, motivation theories. Um, but again, uh, that's not um, the essence of this course, right? So we, we, we look to the lead strategy to help guide us for that too. So we think about experience through practice. How can we be more interactive? And some things that we've done lately are um, include um, three different Harvard case simulations where we get interactive and we apply um, some of these theories, some of these models that we go over. We do uh, an Everest, sim Everest simulation, which we've added, which is an adaptive simulation. Uh, group, group dynamics, um, instructors have done different ways, um, can group by disc. Um, disc types, um, however you want to group them, but um, this adaptive uh, simulation helps um, 
teams go through um, summiting Everest and presents a host of challenges along the way. Um, another one we've done recently, um, Values, which you'll hear from with um, Dr. McBride um, uh, in the Values in Action survey is a crafting your life simulation, which goes through values where, again, once again, adaptive students um, uh, include some of their interests, um, some of their priorities, um, and it kind of goes through a 10 to 15 year period in this simulation where um, they see if some of their values and things that they discussed in a survey and the decisions that they make is their alignment or do they lose focus over time? And then we again, bring it back to some of that reflection and the lead strategy um, and, and, and discuss that. Um, then we think about um, analyzing through reflection, right? So assessments, huge, huge part of the course, self-awareness. Self-awareness is a critical leading self-competency, um, critical in the base of the Coast Guard uh, leadership framework and uh, uh, foundational to their growth um, throughout the, their time in the service. So um, we think about self-awareness. They go through not only the DISC assessment, they've gone through MBTI, they do an emotional intelligence assessment, um, really uh, heavily focused on Goldman's model. Um, and we use these again, we like to say, hey, it's a tool for dialogue, not diagnosis, right? So really getting the students talking, interacting, understanding, um, you know, not only what, you know, some of their tendencies might be, some of their preferences, but what those of others might be. And, hey, how can I work best with others uh, with some of these? And again, a lot of these assessments come to a head, come, come to a discussion in this values in action um, survey and presentation that is ultimately um, one of the major milestones of, of the course, which I believe is, is going to be discussed um, a little bit later. And then thinking about it from the mentoring, again, uh, critical uh, throughout their time in, in the service, but um, you know, with the Values in Action presentation, we ask that all cadets meet with a mentor and, and discuss their values and, and kind of have a discussion on whether you know, they feel that these are aligned, are they different, how do they feel about them, just getting in that conversation with a mentor uh, at the academy. Um, we also bring in um, some guest speakers, some other instructors uh, on campus. We did, recently did a command pa panel with the nautical science department, some junior officers in there. Again, looking to, um, you know, integrate um, other officers and, and, and bring those, um, bring that diversity of thought, diversity of experiences into the classroom. So they're not just hearing uh, from the instructors. And sometimes, uh, as we all know, that that other voice uh, can sometimes make a difference uh, for the students in the classroom. So that's kind of a little bit of some of our methods uh, as instructors in the course. Um, you know, I think there's also that third bullet too here, again, is this kind of a, a new partnership for us, but something that I think really struck me in this partnership with Norwich and, and Ferrum and talking about the course is, you know, one of the things I know Dr. Morris mentioned was a discussion that he did with his students on, on, on the vocation and, and being called to serve. So we're thinking here with our org behavior and leadership students, um, just to set the stage where we're at here, we're looking at sophomore third class cadets, right? So they've recently finished, they've, they've completed their first year, that challenging fourth class year, and they're sort of in this, you know, um, kind of, I don't know, holding state, this, this weird pet, 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 point where they're um, not quite yet leaders within the core. Um, you know, they're also not the fourth class. So, you know, sometimes um, I don't want to say, I don't know if jaded is the right word, but, um, you know, sometimes they need a, a little course correction and, and sort of uh, maybe a, a rejuvenation understa uh, understanding of, hey, you know, why am I here? What ultimately is my goal? What ultimately is my path here? And, and we think in this course is a building block um, before they move into their cadre summer, which is where they transition into leaders. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to what Dr. Morris said, and, and hey, how can we incorporate this discussion of, hey, why am I called to serve? What are some reasons? Um, bring this in in discussions into the classroom. Um, really kind of get that enthusiasm and that why back um, before they move into the critical role, um, I, I think is really important. And again, it also ties right into our lead strategy too. Um, and then, you know, with Dr. McBride and Ferrum, and, and Dr. McBride brought that uniqueness with her background um, to CGA last year with us, you know, coming from the private sector, ha ha having worked in a lot of different industries and organizations. And I think sometimes, um, you know, we can become victims of, uh, you know, getting a little tunnel vision in ter terms of who we bring in, in terms of speakers or who, you know, what cases we do, you know, kind of fo focusing heavily on the military, uh, you know, 
uh, obviously it makes sense, but right, that, you know, diversity of thought and experiences uh, is critical. So we really kind of, you know, as Dr. McBride was with us, look to um, bring some of that, bring some more of that into not only OBNL, but some of our other courses too. And I think that um, a lot of students have really been receptive from hearing um, um, from, from some people outside of the service. And, and, and it's also helped shape, uh, shape their leadership journey as well. So, um, you know, a year in, I think we've, we've taken some, some things from, from Ferrum and Norwich and excited to, uh, continue on in the path, so. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Heller and Lieutenant Commander Gaylor. Uh, so we're gonna go on to the next section. And so here I am. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to begin the Ferrum College portion of this presentation addressing uh, these points, applying USCGA methods and tools in a leadership course in a small Appalachian Methodist school, um, if it worked and whether Norwich University's vocational approach discussed later by Dr. Morris uh, could be of use to our students. So these points uh, were included in the original proposal submitted in October of 2023. I have since finished two sections of principles of leadership taught in fall of 2023, uh, as well as one winter online section. I'm now teaching two sections of uh, principles of leadership for 2024. Okay, so next, please. All righty. So I'll start with the context. Uh, Ferrum College, it began in 1913 as a training school or as what we would view today as a professional school uh, with funding from a women's missionary arm of the United Methodist Church. So back then it was a school for mountain boys and girls who were in dire need of access to opportunities. Uh, and that need has not changed much. And we do offer free tuition to those who require it. So this area is historically known for poverty, um, albeit in the beautiful surrounds of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, to show you what I mean, by need. Uh, U.S. Um, Census Bureau stats for 2022 showed the U.S. overall poverty rate at 11.5 percent, whereas here in Franklin County, Virginia, the poverty rate, according to the same Census Bureau, is 13.3 percent. Our per capita income here is about 39,000 U.S. dollars, uh, which is less than the U.S. as a whole, which stands at about $44,000, right? We have a population of 55,000 people right now living in Franklin County. Out of that, 25% are over the age of 65%. So we're losing population. We are down roughly 2,000 people since 2010. And young people aren't staying here, and our school is actually at risk. We are fighting the fight of our lives right now, in fact. We've got about 750 students, but we should have 1,500 um, this is a Methodist college as well as an Appalachian college. Um, so we are beginning a transition back to our early roots right now as a training school or a professional school, shifting away from liberal arts. Uh, we're forging alliances right now uh, within the local construction industry with area hospitals, which are currently terribly understaffed. We're also an ag college, um, and most of the land around Ferrum is actually owned by the college. So this is mainly an agricultural community with a lot of dangerous mountain roads where our schedules are often defined by the weather. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so the class I'm talking about here is Principles of Leadership 208. Uh, I built it from scratch in the fall of 2023. So from start to finish, uh, it is mine. It has a strange designation of being both a gen ed course uh, while also being a requirement for business majors, which is a leftover remnant of academic committees long gone by. Um, if you are not an academic, I don't really have time to explain, but um, gen ed and business majors are distinct areas. Um, so my two sections of business 208 had students from different majors. Uh, however, the composition of students in my two sections were not the same. So in my 8 a.m. class, about half the students were first year and many students were not business majors, although some were business minors. Um, my afternoon class was different. Most of the students were business majors and most were not first year students. Okay, so next. Okay, so I thought USCGA practices made sense. Um, I don't have much time to develop, delve into my rationale, but I figured students at Ferrum, in a nutshell, would have shared values or a strong foundation of values, much like cadets in the CGA, right? So I implemented the USCGA's VIA presentation methodology in both of the aforementioned sections of principles of leadership. Uh, with the help of Ferrum College's Career Center, I got MBTI questionnaires, uh, the booklets, and students took the MBTIs out of class. Uh, they brought back the MBTIs to me. I then gave them to the director of the Career Center, and the Career Center did the scoring and provided detailed feedback in the form of comprehensive, 
a comprehensive report for each student. The director of the Career Center even visited my classes to discuss them. Uh, students also took the character strength survey that's used at the CGA, which shows them a listing of their top character strengths. And there are 24 strengths in all, but we focused on students' top three, so in class discussions. That made sense. And class dis discussions around strength, uh, those strengths were interesting. The class mixes were so different. I'll give you a great example that really speaks to the whole semester experience for me. So um, in uh, one of my classes, um, I had my uh, myself and my students worked out the, the class's top strengths on the whiteboard so we could break the students into groups. Um, and in my afternoon class, this, acti uh, this activity actually turned into a rowdy discussion around the character strength survey. Uh, students were separated into groups based on their top one or two strengths. And I had a group of about five students in a corner whose number one strength was humor. And this was a group of football and basketball players. And they laughed from start to finish, booming laughter. And the energy in the room was great. So each group was asked to come up with a poster that encapsulated their strength. And the humor group's poster was hilarious. The humor group presented their poster last and they had the whole room laughing, just holding their stomachs and falling out of their chairs. It was so funny. It was one of the best presentations, honestly, I've ever seen in my life. Now, on the other hand, in the morning section of Business 208, which is Tuesday, Thursday, those um, you know first year students, what, what have you, we did the same activity. This is a day after, right? Uh, my afternoon class. Humor did not come up as a top strength. We had one student with humor as a top strength, but it really didn't come up across the class. So as a professor, as an observer, I'm going to speak quite candidly in a way that I think other educators can understand. I was actually amazed at the difference in energy and interactions between the two classes. It was absolutely like night and day, right? So with regard to the, pre, uh, the VIA presentations, the results were also mixed, also kind of that night and day. Um, by and large, however, um, students knew what to do and the presentations were like the presentations at the USCGA, right? So they they got on board, they, they generally knew what to do. I didn't have any poor performers per se. However, my first section, right, with the um, first year students, there were students who did not do the presentation, turned it in late, didn't show up to present, et cetera. So I actually failed some students in that uh, section, at least four students, like, um, but I sent out retention alerts. Uh, I communicated with student services. I did all the things that I was supposed to do, which I'm sure all of you academics are familiar with. Uh, I tried to get to these students. So um, next class, I'm sorry, next slide, please. <laughs> so I have wondered if business majors are more people oriented. Um, perhaps that has something to do with the afternoon classes, different kind of dynamic. More likely, however, I think students uh, do better once they clear that first year. So even more specifically, the plain fact of the matter is first year students are probably the worst now than they've ever been. And this is being experienced actually across colleges and universities. Um, it's especially true at Ferrum College because we have an open door admissions policy. And the USCGA by contrast is extremely hard to get into and Norwich is the same. So very high admission standards. Um, so at Ferrum, it, moreover, it's not just the grades, it's also behavioral issues uh, that I'm, I'm witnessing, the likes of which I've never experienced before. And it's not all of my students. It's not all of my students at all. But again, if you have four students in a class who won't participate in discussions, it hurts activities across the class, and the, cl and the class as a whole feels it. Um, so I did introduce the concept of vocation, and again, uh, discussion more, was more lively in that, um, that more advanced afternoon class than it was... Uh, in that first year class. Uh, the VIA, again, a great activity. Um, I think it can be embraced by all students. They, they loved it, they enjoyed it. Whether military or non-military, um, students have experiences they can draw from and the activity is, is enjoyable. I'm not gonna say that students show up and they don't have appropriate leadership experience. They really do draw from some amazing experiences. It's wonderful. Um, and adv adding vocation to the mix will be useful, I think, especially for uh, graduate level classes, for the simple fact that it's more work, practically speaking, right? You're adding some more work to it. I hesitate to recommend it for the first year students, however, depending on um, the state of your college, your admission standards, et cetera, uh, with the caveat, caveat again, uh, we are open admissions. Ideally, your students should be at a developmental level where they're prepared to engage with uh, others because this activity and this discipline in general, leadership, organizational behavior, requires active engagement and it's highly interpersonal. Um, so my final slide. All right, so uh, 2024, what's up? Um, so demand for my classes, it, it has been very high actually. So I'm, I'm teaching a large load of classes, six uh, 
altogether. Um, I've scratched my head about students wanting to take my classes. I, I've often wondered why are they, why do they want to take my classes? So many of them, but I don't have much time to think about it. Going forward, I am going to continue combining that MPTI and vocation. I intend to include more of the vocation aspects. I have an incredible uh, on-campus co cohort this semester. It's a lot of fun. More advanced, actually, students are in, in this cohort. Maybe they heard about the classes from before. I'm not entirely sure what happened. Um, I do have an online co cohort. But I've also added another dimension for this. Um, I was listening to uh, Lieutenant C Commander Gaylor and Mr. Heller speaking about the guest speakers that they have. So right now we're uh, focusing on um, building community and I'm inviting speakers who organize a festival here called the Floyd Fest. I'm gonna bring them to class and I'm gonna focus on this notion of um, how do you create spaces that draw people in where you have an energy that actually brings people in. So I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Morris now, and thank you. Thanks so much. That was, both of those um, presentations were really um, thought provoking. So thank you all. Can you, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Great, um, thanks. So yeah, and just wanted to say thanks before I get started to um, Dr. McBride, Lieutenant Commander Gaylor and Mr. Heller. This collaboration has been, um, you know, uh, wonderful as far as um, spurring thoughts about leadership and vocation. And uh, thanks also to MOBTS for um, allowing us to give this presentation. So um, as you can see on this slide, uh, the landscape is a little bit different at Norwich right now than it is um, uh, at Ferrum and I'm sure also in Australia. This is the view at Norwich from my office window. So it's very snowy and um, uh, the Hawaiian shirt that I was asked to wear for this presentation um, doesn't quite match our climate, but I'm doing the best I can. So um, there are three points that I'm going to discuss here, uh, starting with the rationale for engaging with uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. In the spring of 2023, Dr. McBride, Lieutenant Commander Gaylor, and Mr. Heller gave a panel presentation at Norwich University's annual leadership conference. Their discussion was about leadership training at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, which they've already summarized really well in this presentation. What struck me most during their uh, panel talk was the way that their coursework and experiential learning reserved some space for structured reflection on what I would call questions of vocation. I want to emphasize here that I'm using the language of vocation and that they did not explicitly, explicitly use that language. And I don't intend to put uh, words in their mouths. And I recognize that that specific language doesn't fit everyone's contexts. However, at the time of their presentation, I noted significant overlap between what they were doing at the Coast Guard Academy and what I was trying to do at Norwich. The Coast Guard faculty who taught in the leadership program indicated that sophomore students were asked as part of their coursework to reflect on questions of personal identity and meaning that motivate students to seek careers in the U.S. military in general and uh, with the Coast Guard more specifically. These questions of personal identity and meaning are, I think, highly important for developing leaders. And I just want to note um, that the one thing that's come up in both the, the conversations we've heard already in this presentation is the sophomore year is very important for this kind of reflection, and I think that's worth noting. As a scholar of ethics and religious studies, I approach these questions as part of the topic of vocation, which means calling. For most of Western history, the idea of calling has been part of, of a more general Christian theological uh, way of thinking, which imply or explicitly state that human beings are created by God, given certain skills and passions, and based on those skills and passions, called by God to live specific kinds of lives, using their skills and passions to serve the world's areas of great need. In this sense, vocation means that we all have certain gifts and we're called to use them in certain ways that are beneficial to others. Often, but not always, thinking about vocation means that people are called to do certain kinds of work. Thus, when we're called to certain jobs, we can understand work in those jobs as living at the intersection of skills, passions, and the world's needs. One's calling does not necessarily be, need to be reflected in one's job. It could be reflected in volunteer work, family life, the arts, or other areas. However, the idea of calling is frequently used to help young people think about career paths, and it can help sustain people in the jobs that they choose. The language of vocation doesn't need to be part of Christian theological frameworks either. 
young people can use the idea in a secularized way by thinking of, of the places where their skills and passions meet the world's needs and about the meaning and purpose that animate the work that they do often, but not always in their paid employment. Here are some assumptions that I make about vocation in my work at Norwich and in my collaboration with Dr. McBride, Lieutenant Commander Gaylor, and Mr. Heller. One, thinking about vocation will help students dis discern how to live their best life, especially in their career paths. Two, thinking about vocation will help young people who are considering careers in the military understand the reasons why they're pursuing those careers with greater clarity. Three, thinking about vocation will help young people, including but not limited to those pursuing careers in the military, develop into competent leaders. This is key. To be able to lead self and others, one must be able to articulate what skills and passions one has, and also how those skills and passions meet the world's needs. And then number four, thinking about vocation will help young people ser who serve in the military to sustain themselves through the enormous challenges that they face. When I heard the U.S. Coast Guard panel at Norwich in the spring of 2023, all kinds of alarm bells started going off in my mind because these faculty members seem to have integrated thinking about reflection into, thinking about vocation, sorry, into their leadership curriculum. And because of these four assumptions, that's exactly what I wanted to do at Norwich. So second section, Norwich's approach to leadership programming. Norwich University has made robust investments in its leadership programming. Uh, we offer majors and minors in leadership with courses designated with a leadership prefix and with supplementing courses from related disciplines. We have a leadership center which coordinates programming such as the annual conference, which is where I heard about the work of my collaboration partners. Norwich also has leadership as one of its eight general education goals. All students must complete some class that fulfills this general education requirement in leadership. My effort to infuse leadership programming with vocational reflection has been supported by the Network for Vocation in Undergraduate Education. Norwich received a generous grant to generate a conversation about vocation and vocational programming uh, at Norwich in academic year 2022 and 23. We use that grant to fund some lectures at the intersection of vocation and leadership, host a book discussion about vocation and leadership over lunch, and sponsor several faculty dinners that allowed us to have deeper conversations about how Norwich could prompt students to think about their vocations more intentionally and in tandem with leadership. We are so grateful to NetView, that's the Network for Vocation in Undergraduate Education, for allowing us to go deeper into these questions. And then third and last for me, uh, the challenges of developing leader students into future leaders and what tools work best. So we at Norwich are at the earliest stages of joining vocational reflection with leadership studies. And so our results are preliminary. However, one extra credit assignment from last year was quite revealing. Several faculty members asked students to respond to an essay in the book, Vocation Across the Academy, edited by David Cunningham. The essay argued that students will experience conflict in their senses of calling. That is, their passions and skills might not exactly line up, and the lives that they feel called to live might change. Students' responses to this argument were fascinating and suggested deeper study would be helpful for developing leaders. For example, one student indicated that he felt called to serve in the army largely because both his mother and father had done so. But then when he arrived at Norwich, he felt a different call, which led him to consider a career in the Navy. This conflict of calling caused considerable distress, partly because he felt he was no longer being true to his original commitment, and partly because he felt he would be letting his parents down by changing branches. This is the simple example, but many others were similar, and each of them lead me to the following conclusions. Intentional vocational reflection could lead students to understand that skills and passions change and that one's parents' vocation may not necessarily be one's own and that the meaning and purpose one identifies in one's career will probably evolve. In terms of leadership, it seems self-evident to me that vocational reflection of this kind serves as a pillar supporting the life of leadership in the military and other careers. One cannot successfully lead self or others if one has not intentionally explored the ways 
in which one's skills and passions might meet the world's needs. One cannot successfully lead self or others if one has not given serious thought to the senses of meaning and purpose that animate one's own life and work. And that's all from me. Thank you so much. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, if you would like to reach out, um, I'll provide my email uh, to the Academy, T. McBride at ferrum.edu. Um, and thank you so much for watching our presentation. Thank you.